Hi, I'm Lisa Givens, and I'm a friend and student of James Malinchek's. I have worked with you as an audience member in your seminars. Uh, I've been able to co-facilitate some of your um, seminars with your students, and I love what you do. I love watching you do your thing, James. Well, thank you so much. I, it's an honor to be here with you. I've been a fan forever, <laughs> and now uh, to actually be able to co-facilitate and help people with you is an amazing blessing. The thing that I respond to among a long list of many is watching your infectious enthusiasm because it jumps from you to everyone on the receiving end and they incorporate that and up their game. Well, I, I just feel so blessed, you know, that what I get to do, I get to empower people to overcome challenges and be better. And what greater feeling when you see somebody go from where they are to where they desire to be and their, li their life changes, their business changes, their relationships change. I mean, it's just a true blessing, and, and I'm so grateful to be able to do that. This man mm -hmm. is the real deal because <laughs> you didn't start out being... <laughs> You know, the, the millionaire, big money speaker guy uh, that everybody goes to for expert advice. Oh, gosh. No, I, I grew up in a small steel mill town near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I mean, you blink, you miss it on a map kind of thing. And um, uh, my dad was a steel worker. My mom served lunches at the, the school. And so what I had to do is really learn a lot of skills that would allow me to achieve these dreams and goals that I desired. And, you know, I'm really big on mentors and learning from people and watching, observing, and modeling, and that's what I try to share with my students is, you know, they're all the, go like this, Lisa, all the information for anything we want to do is out there. Yeah. We just got to go grab it and learn from it and grab it. grab it and take it to heart and use it. And so I always say it doesn't matter where you start in life, it's where you decide to finish. Now that's different than where you finish, it's where you decide to finish. Decide to finish. It's our choice. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, here, I'll give you a little quiz. Okay. Three frogs are sitting on a lily pad. Okay. One decides to jump off. How many are still left on the pad? Two, right? Yes, I'm thinking it's a trick question. Oh, you're so good. <laughs> Stop it. Okay, three frogs on a lily pad. One decides to jump off. Okay. How many are still left on the pad? Two. No, three. Deciding to jump and actually jumping are two separate things. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> and that's, that's the whole key. You know, deciding to use things that can make you better and grow your life and grow your business. You and can't then doing you, it. You gotta do it. You can't just decide. You talk a lot about taking fast action, bold action, doing it fast. Absolutely. Why is that so important? Well, you know, if we, it will never be perfect. Have you ever noticed I'm waiting and waiting, I'm gonna try to get it perfect? And whatever you're doing is never going to be right. It's never going to be perfect. So, what I say is you take off and you go for it, and you, of course, adjust along the way, or you'll never get started. I have a lot of folks that say, you know, I'm, I'm trying, but I'm still a recovering perfectionist. Well, it's never going to be perfect. So one of my favorite quotes is by a legendary motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar, mm -hmm. says, you don't have to be great to get started, but you gotta get started to be great. There it is. Yeah. And you find, I guess, that many of your students and the people who are in your audience that's one of the biggest obstacles, just oh. taking that step. Well, it's for all of us. For everybody. You know, for everybody, anything we do in life, you know. And I think this, anytime we want to try something new, we get fearful, we get nervous, because it's, you know, unwalked territory, if you mm -hmm. will. But, you know, once you start, think about the first time you rode a bike. Right. You wobbled, you fell off. A lot of skin knees. Skin knees, you're nervous, like, oh, I don't want to do this. What if I fail again? But, you know, the more you kept getting up, doing it the right way, the more you, you learned how to balance, all of a sudden one day you just zoomed. Now you don't think about riding a bike. Yeah. And I just believe it's like that for everything we try in life. There's that wobbling, there's the unbalance. And then one day we just wake up and we master a skill and we are able to do it and it becomes habitual. Mm -hmm. So I always remember that when I'm trying something new. That you're gonna get there. I'm, gonna, I'm going to get there. This is just, this is a great point. This is just part of the process. I've got to wobble a little bit. I've got to be off balance. But you know, once I master the skill, I'll get there. Yeah. And, and that's what I try to share with everybody. It's like the markers of success are failures. A hundred percent. Yeah. One of my greatest uh, lines I heard a long time ago is everything I've learned about succeeding, I've learned from failing. True that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think failure is really failure. I just believe they're educational experiences, learning experiences, if you allow your eyes and ears to catch the message and learn from them. And it's funny how often we do block that, you know, oh, yeah. but, but reframing it as, 
I must be doing something right, I'm failing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as long as you understand it's a stepping stone, it's a growing phase, and you learn from it, how do I adjust? How do I not let it happen again? How do I go onward and upward from this uh, obstacle, this adverse? It's like a pothole in the road. Mm -hmm. You're going to hit potholes, but you don't stop driving. You know, you keep going and you try to avoid the pothole the next time. I like when you talk about doing things the right way. Mm. And that's that's been, I think, a, a message point that makes so much sense, even though we tend to put a lot of um, emphasis on, oh my gosh, am I doing it right or wrong? But there is a right way. Well, I always say, you know, folks were taught, and I was taught growing up in a small steel mill town, you gotta work hard. And, and I believe that, and I still believe that to this day to a certain extent. And then there's the, the cliche that gets passed around, don't work harder, work smarter. smarter. And I say, that's not correct. You must work right first. If you're not working right, doesn't matter how hard you work, how smart you think you're working, you're not working right. So we focus on teaching my students, you work right, let's do the right things and do it the right, by the way, when you work right, everything happens faster. Yeah. And then you work smart at what you're working right at, and then you work hard at what you're working smart and right at. These are not just catchphrases and words from this man who has all of this kind of institutional knowledge. You give strategies and you give ways to implement this in your life and ways to incorporate it so that it delivers on the promise for you. Oh, absolutely. You know, I try to teach in nuggets because I think if I can break it down into very simplistic, and you do this so well. I mean, I just watched you do this with my amazing audience. Nuggets that people can actually apply right away. When I teach, I want people to walk outside the door and use the thing, like mm -hmm. whatever it is, right away. Or I want them to, to do it at the table while they're sitting there. You know, I don't think success has to be difficult. I don't think achieving what you want to achieve has to be difficult. I think we as human beings have complicated it. So I try to give tiny little things, and here's what I believe. If I can get them to just switch and, and shift for the better for a little bit, that builds momentum, mm -hmm. and then they can achieve the goals. You know, I always say, uh, yard by yard, success is hard. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Oh, I love that one. I love that one. You often challenge your students and those in your audience to ask themselves, okay, what is the one thing I'm going to do today or mm. tonight or right, right now? Why is that so important? It builds that momentum. If I could just get them to implement something, you know, even if it's not correct, we could course correct. But what I've found is if you don't start implementing right away, you don't get any rewards, you don't get any momentum. You know, and I believe the universe rewards speed and implementation. So we just got to get it moving. So if I can give one thing to what, what's the one thing? Not five things, not 50 things. Just pick one thing wherever you are in your life that's right for you. And let's start working on that. Let's start using that and let that build and grow and open up build. to all the others. How do you get to the top of the uh, staircase? Get one step at a one time. step at a time. But he, if you don't take that first step, and so I just try to get them to take that first step. We had the mm -hmm. coolest thing happen. <laughs> James and I have been working together. I've been able to be a guest um, speaker at um, one of your weekend events. An amazing speaker, Thank you by for the way. that. Thank <laughs> you for the opportunity. We had someone sitting over there have one of those epiphany moments of, oh my gosh, this stuff really works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was something you taught. And uh, this, this gentleman sent a text message to someone. The person sent the text message back and was like so grateful. And he was so shocked. He came up to me, he's like, look, it works. I mean, well, of course it works. You know, and here's yeah. what I believe, right? Strategies, concepts, principles, ideas, they work. You just have to work them. You have to work them. You have to work the strategies, concepts, and ideas. I'm going to tell you what I found unexpected mm. in the audience and the, the people who follow you and your work and our, our students and collaborators with you. There is someone from every walk of life, mm. someone at every age, someone mm. at every financial realm of, of possibilities. The commonality is always reaching for something better and mm. wanting to learn more and grow and being open to that. Mm. But you don't have one kind of person. You have all kinds of people who are looking. We're all looking for something else, right. something more. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons that uh, I may get those folks from different demographics, if you will, is because I have strategies, patterns, blueprints, and habits that work. I mean, they're indisputable. You know, you, you can't not not do these things and have success. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're tall or short, rich or poor, young or old, male or female, doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter where you're going. You follow these principles, it's like a map. You plug something into a GPS, you'll get there, 
right? Doesn't matter if you're driving X car, Y car, doesn't matter if you grew up in Irmo, South Carolina, Manesson, Pennsylvania, New York City, you plug in to the GPS, the course, wherever you're going, if we're all trying to go from A to B, we'll get to that destination. That's no different for success and achievement. And as successful as you are, and as many, many of the people in your audience are wildly successful, so they've got now a new blueprint, a new mm -hmm. plan, a new course, because they have upped their game. Absolutely. You know, when I always say, um, people ask me, why do people come to your things 20, 30 times? Like, literally. So we, we have a, a customer, a client, who's been to my event almost 35 times, maybe more. 30 times. Yeah. And now he doesn't come back because he's a slow learner. <laughs> What's he not getting? <laughs> no, folks come back because when they come, their knowledge level might be here. When they come back a second time, now it's here because their mind is expanded and they pick up all the stuff that they missed here. And then they come back another time and they pick up all the stuff here and here. And, and I believe you and I are the same way. Of course. I mean, have you read a book the fifth time and picked up something you missed the first four? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. It's the same. And, and so what I always say is you don't go to school once in your life. You're in school every single day of your life. The minute you choose to stop learning, you will stop earning. And if you want to go more, you have to grow more. You can't expect your success level to be here and your knowledge level is here. And we're always constantly changing and evolving. So as we change and evolve, we raise this, we raise this, we raise this, we raise this. A lot of your life's work now jump-started from when you were on America's Secret Millionaire. Yeah. That was um, an incredible vessel mm. for you. It was uh, one of the greatest blessings. You know, I, I get asked, well, what was it like to be on Secret Millionaire, meet these folks who were just angels? You know, they're contributing to the community. They're changing lives. I don't even call them people. They're angels. You know, yeah. they're, they're just doing because they want to do, you know, making people's lives better. And so I was asked, like, well, what was it like? And originally I thought, okay, I'm going to go on this show. I'm going to live undercover as the secret millionaire. I'm going to meet people. I'll write some checks to them at the end of our time. And then, boom, I'm off, you know. Man, I got so much more out of what I learned from them than I believe they got out of the money. Wow. Let me tell you something I learned. I learned that rich is more than money. Yes. You know, we think wealth is, is rich, and that's a part of it, absolutely. But I learned something. Can I tell you a story? Please. I'm with my, my friend Coach Tony on Secret Millionaire. We're about day three, and I needed a cup of coffee. I'm living on $44.66 for a week. Um, for the show? For the whole week for the show. Not one day. I remember, week. I remember when they handed me $44.66. I said, oh, this is cool. I don't eat that much every day. And they, they said, went, no, no, no honey. this is per week. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Because the premise was to see if, if you could inhabit the, the other world. 100%. Yeah. yeah, they, no television, no cell phone, no computer, I, no connection with my real life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was secret. I was stranded. I just pick you up and boom, drop you. Right? It's That's a cool. shock. Yeah, it was cool. But you know what happened? I started saying, how am I going to do this? How do I live on $44? It was all about me. And I know everyone has different spiritual beliefs. I believe it was a God thing. I believe God spoke to me and said, dude, it's not about you. He actually said, dude. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> dude. dude. Hey, dude. come not, on. It's not about you. It's about meeting these people and learning what they're doing. So here we are like day three. And I'm saving up. I'm balancing my budget, if you will. And I tell my friend, Coach Tony, I say, can we just stop and get a cup, a cup of coffee? We're out in the community trying to raise money for his charitable group. And I say, I need a cup of coffee. So we go into this store, this pharmacy, and the guy puts up two cups. And he says, that'll be $2, a dollar a piece. Lisa, selfishly, I said, oh, Coach, I'm sorry. I can't afford your cup not thinking because I'm worried wow. about balancing my money for the I've time. I've got $44. I'm down low. Yeah. Selflessly, without hesitation, he says, what are you talking about? You're my friend. You're in my town. You don't pay. And he threw down two $1 bills. And so mm -hmm. people say, well, so what? Well, here's the so what. He didn't know anything about my background because I was undercover, but I knew about him. I knew he was going through tough financial times. I knew he was about to lose his home. I knew he hadn't worked in a year and a half. And I sat, I stood there and I said, how can I be so selfish? This guy didn't hesitate, you know, and he didn't really have 
a lot of monetary means. But here's what happened. I learned a couple things right there. I said, number one, rich is more than money. This guy didn't have money, but he was richer than people I know who have millions mm. of dollars. Number two, I said, you know what? If this guy lets me, I'll be his friend for the rest of his life, and I will teach him business skills so he can raise money for these kids. And number three, I will do whatever I can to help him, and I'll be his best bud for life because he taught me a pivotal life moment right there. That's really powerful. Yeah. And that's what happened. And that's what happened. And we're still best buds. And that's what <laughs> happened. But you had to step into that too. I had to step into it, be open. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I believe life kicks you in the shins when you need it. Always. <laughs> right? Yeah. And sometimes unexpectedly, you know. And so uh, at that moment, it was just life changing. So, yeah, I, I wrote some checks to these folks, but look what I got out of it. And now through speaking or books or coaching, I get to share that life lesson with people that their lives are changed and maybe they share it with their family, their kids, their lives are changed. So Coach Tony taught me a great life lesson and he is actually the one impacting all these lives. That's really very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Thank That's you. That's super cool. I love, I love, I, I'm a junkie for this kind of information yeah. and there are a lot of us that are addicts. So I love <laughs> many of the messengers. I love this messenger because you're hysterical. <laughs> I mean, you are so funny and so quick to laugh, and you just have a, a lightness about you that's really infectious. Well, you know how that happened. My sister Vicki has been one of my biggest inspirations. She passed away of a brain tumor several years ago. And as she was going through this unexpected thing, she never once moaned, never once complained. I never heard her once say, why me? And she was the sweetest, nicest, let me change that, she is the sweetest, nicest person. Nice. Never harmed anyone. It was always happy. To, and, and I realized something. I watched my sister pass away and never complain. Why am I not happy every day? And why am I complaining that the car doesn't start? Or, oh my gosh, we're in a hotel ballroom. We can't get on Facebook today. <laughs> <laughs> There's no internet. Who cares? Like seriously, right? Like, come on, there are worse things that happen. <laughs> So just be grateful and happy. Yeah, we all get irritable. We all go through situations of challenge. I get it, but I always remember this. I don't care how tough my situation is. Someone somewhere is having a more difficult time. Well, your path has been tough at times, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is a guy that would, you know, wait outside. For how long did you wait? <laughs> For, to meet Jack Canfield. Oh my gosh, a few hours and scraped together $95, spread it over a couple credit cards because I didn't have $95. You know, it's back when I was eating top ramen noodles and big jars of uh, spaghetti sauce diluted with water and I don't even know, 50, 60, 100 bags of pasta under my bed because it was cheap and put the diluted, you know, spaghetti sauce with the noodles and I can have three meals with one bag. And I mean, I, I did all that working in a video store, trying to figure out how to just, you know, get enough money to, to eat, if you will. And so uh, when I had this opportunity, when I set a goal to meet Jack Canfield, I said, man, I'm going to do whatever I have to, scrape together the money, stood out there for hours waiting for the door to open so he can walk in, walk in and ask him if I can sit right next to him at this event and talk to him for a few hours because I figure he's going to talk to someone, might as well be me. That's what I love about <laughs> you say, why not me? Yeah, might as well, right? And so and that's what I try to share with people. When you're going to go for something and it's, and it's big and it's scary and it's like, oh, I never did this before, just say, might as well be me. It's going to be someone. Right. You know, why not you? You know what? People always say this too, you know, what if I fail? What if it doesn't work out? What if things go wrong? And I say, you got to reframe that. You have to say, well, what if it works out great? What if like great things happen? What if I get great blessings? But we, we tend to focus on the negative. Yeah. And you know this, but one, whatever you focus on, your mind expands, accepts it, and that's what it drives you toward. That's what you get. I had that lesson taught to me in a very real way. I was racing cars. And really? the, it was part <laughs> of a, the, um, the, the Celebrity Toyota oh. Grand Prix. <laughs> and um, in the test drive, the um, qualifying rounds, I'm racing with my instructor for qualifying, and all I could think about was the curve coming up. So mm. I focused on that curve mm. coming up instead of where I was going, which was around the curve. And it was such a real example. I've never had a wreck before or after. Wow. We hit the wall. Um, I, I looked over, the instructor was bleeding underneath the helmet. I really thought this is horrible. Oh my gosh. 
it turned out to be he was fine. He now has an L scar <laughs> on his face. You're welcome. It turned out to be one of those great moments where I realized mm. that stuff is true. You do get what you focused on, and I was focused on the wrong thing. You're focused on the wall, so you hit the wall so instead the wall. of going yeah, around. So wow. You always talk about how this stuff is really simple when you break it down. Um, and we tend to think that life has to be complicated. Oh. You take that right off the table. I really think success, I th I've thought about this. Success comes down to three things. And, and who am I to say out of everything you could do that there are three things. I just try to like break it down to make it simple for me. If it works for me, great. I'm just going to share with you what works for me. And if it works for you, I hope it helps. But I really think it's three things. What are they? Number one is mindset. It's not pie in the sky, wishful thinking. I mean, you've got to change your mindset and you've got to train yourself to think differently on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Because thoughts become things. 100%. They become our belief system Absolutely. and that drives it, right? It drives everything we do. Your thoughts become your belief system. Your belief system becomes your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits create your results. Yep. So number one, you have to change the way you think, okay? But that's not enough. Number two, so it's mindset. Number two is you've got to get a skill set. You have to learn certain things. There are certain practical things in anything you do that you must do. If you're a real estate agent and you say, I'm going to be a top real estate agent, right? And you change your mindset to think and believe in yourself. Well, that's not enough. What do top real estate agents do in the, in the practical every day of running the business? There are things they do that, that lower you know, achieving agents don't do, right? Yep. So number one is mindset. Number two, you've got to have some skill set, but that's not enough. The third component's missing. It's mindset, skill set. Number three, it's get off your assets and do something. <laughs> Use the stuff, <laughs> right? Because if you don't, you'll always be where you've always been. you always get what you've always gotten, so don't be surprised. So, don't, so you put it out there. So who's shocked at that? <laughs> yeah, so you need the triangle. Mindset, skill set, get off your assets. assets. <laughs> I'm down with that now. I'm totally down with that now. You turn things around often, and many of us have heard things all our lives, and mm. we go, well, that's right. Like you know, um, leap, oh, right? Yeah. And you'll grow wings or, yeah. you know, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, or leap and the, net, you'll, and the net will appear. The net will appear. I don't know about you, but I've leaped a lot of times and I have crashed. <laughs> no <laughs> net waiting for you. No, and, and what I say is I just don't believe that is, is true. I believe we should go after what we want, but to just blindly leap without really thought and strategy behind it or maybe a backup plan if something doesn't work out. That'd be like saying, you know, just leap out of an airplane and skydive, but don't have an instructor, don't understand how to pull a cord. Just leap and the parachute will appear. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I see folks who, you know, take um, massive loans and start a business to just leap, but they have, they have no idea how to prospect, qualify, present, close, get people to come into their business, get people to come back again and again, get referrals. Those are skill sets, mm -hmm. but they just leap and put an open sign on their business that says open. And what I say is, nah, if you study small business stats, most small businesses are out of business at 12 to 18 months, your clock's ticking. I sure would learn the skills of opening the business before I leaped. That's a lot of what you talk about, though, is yeah. how to get people to come back and use your services again and again, to sign up again and again, to buy the product again and again, because, uh, you know, a base hit is a base hit. Right, right. You know, if the value is high enough and if you're always looking for ways to serve and uh, impact people's lives and what might fill a hole or a void in, in what they're doing and you can, you can do that for them, they'll come back again and again as long as you deliver and over deliver on what you, you promise. So, you know, people say uh, under promise, over deliver. I'm like, that is a load of BS. Oh, really? Yeah, over promise and then over, over, over deliver. <laughs> Why would you under promise? When you have great stuff, promise big as long as you could, you know, deliver on it and then deliver 10 times more. And then just give more. And give more and more and more and you'll have people come back. You know, you don't under-promise. That, that's kind of defeating your talent, defeating what you could do, defeating how you can serve people. You know, don't under-promise and over That's a load of BS. Over-promise and then over, over, over-deliver. It's the power of more, I guess. The power of more. And, and by the way, it puts you in the right framework and the right mindset of serving. And what mm -hmm. can I add to this person's life? Or what can I add to our customers' lives? You know, how could we over-deliver? What else could we do for them? James did something that I saw from the audience this week. I had never before have heard about the power of the napkin. 
And when I saw you tucking a napkin into your shirt, I thought, what <laughs> on earth are you doing? <laughs> well, it's a great metaphor and a great analogy that uh, I, I learned a long time ago. You know, when we're born, this napkin here, we're born, we get this bib placed under our chin, and we go through life programmed believing that's how we should be. You know, because we get served as a from an infant you know, stage, we go through life believing that we should be taking, because that gets programmed into our subconscious mind. Subconsciously, mind. somebody's giving me something yeah, all the time. Yeah, so I should go through life like that, where everybody gives to me. And if you really want to get ahead in life, you need to take that off from around your chin and drape it over your arm like you're a waiter or a waitress in the finest dining establishment on the planet, and you approach people with, how can I serve you? How can I make a difference in your life? What could I do for you? A great friend of mine, Professor Joe Martin, taught me that years ago, and I just it's been one of the most impactful things for me. The visual of that going from receiving to serving yeah. is so powerful, and that's, that is a reframe, a pivot, a, a life choice that can can not only be more satisfying but open the door to a lot of abundance you know and if there's anybody who epitomizes this it's you oh I mean, that's you, very sweet no you, you do and your husband Stephen. you all walk through life you know the time that i've known you with like what could i do I, Stephen on the phone james what could we do to make your event better you on the phone with me you know well tell me about your students what could we do how can i do this you know, and you guys just walk through serving people and but that's how we all should be you know, and it, and it took me a while to figure that out, like, you know, because we're not taught this in high school. Yeah. We're not taught this in college, elementary school, you know, middle school. No one teaches us these life skills that sustain us for the rest of our lives. And so just go through life trying to make people's lives better and, you know, adding smiles to people's faces. And that's what you do. I watch you and you're like, oh, my God, people just radiate to you because they love being around because you make them feel good. Well, thank you, you make for them that. feel valued. I, I really enjoy the energy that we get from each other. Mm -hmm. And for someone that does what you do, there's a lot of energy that goes out. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you get that, that fed back to you. But as you look at books that you're writing and clients that you're working with and, and ways that you're offering your gift, mm -hmm. where does that go? You know, I'm sort of at this phase in my life where I'm, I call it the light bulb phase. You ever hear of the light bulb face? I, I don't think I don't I've think, had it yet. No, because I, well, <laughs> I think I just made it up. <laughs> like, well, let's hear no, and I really think like, well, at this phase of my life, I, you know, at one phase I was climbing. You know, one phase, okay, I hit a level, and now I'm going to a different mountaintop. And at this stage of my life, I'm in the light bulb phase. I just made it as the light bulb phase, and and I want to see as many light bulbs go off in people's eyes as possible, with stuff that I teach. You know, and that is really, you know, you and I were teaching and, and I'd look out, you would say something or I would say something and I would see somebody just staring like and go, oh, that's a light bulb face. Mm. That's a light bulb moment, you know, and they'd write something down or they'd come up to you after and say, oh, I never thought about that. Well, I had many light bulb moments when you were talking, like, man, I never thought about that. You know, and I'm up here as we're talking or I'm in the back taking notes. Well, that's another thing I got to do. I never learned that. I never knew this. I had many light bulb moments. And so what I realize is I'm in this light bulb phase right now. I want as many light bulbs going off in people's eyes as possible. That's when you know you made a difference and they're happy yeah. with what you're teaching. What is it you said about you learn the most after you think you know everything? Oh, yes. One of my favorite quotes. Who said that? That's a great quote. I had the honor and privilege uh, of having lunch with someone that you knew as well, Coach John Wooden, UCLA basketball, greatest coach probably ever in sports. And I had lunch with him several years at his condominium in Southern California, and it was such a thrill because I love basketball. And here I am, this basketball guy, thinking I'm going to learn all this basketball stuff for five hours, and I learned more about life mm -hmm. than basketball. And um, I asked him at the end, and I said, what is the most important piece of advice you could give me. I know you have a lot of ideas and strength, but if you could just give me one that I could take with me for the rest of my life, what would that one be? And I don't know if you know this, Lisa, but that's a hard question. I, th I was just thinking, like, well, that is an say? impossible question. Yeah, it's, it's one thing out of many, right? But without hesitation, Mr. Wooden said, oh, that's easy, James. It's what you learn after you think you know it all that counts. And I said, Coach, what do you mean? He said, so many people go through life like this. Oh, I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't need to learn anymore. 
Or, you know, I hit a certain level. I'm at the top of my game. I'm a top performer, top achiever. I don't need to have coaches, or I don't need to practice, or I don't need to read books, or I don't need to, you know, meditate or pray or whatever that is for that person. They think they've arrived. Mm. And, you know, you, you, what I've learned is you don't go to school once in your life. You're in school every day of your every life. Day. And I love what Coach uh, Wooden said that, you know, it, it's that quote that changed my life. And I have a friend uh, that you know, Kevin Eastman. He has uh, been in basketball his whole life. And Kevin has a great, great line that I love. He says, don't go through life being a know-it-all. Go through life being a learn-it-all. Learn it all. And learn it all. Be a sponge. Take it in. And so, you know, it's what you learn after you think you know it all that counts. It, in a, it, from a man that had so many memorable things, oh. that's a great one. Oh, and he never stopped learning. Yeah. It was amazing in his home, the number of books he had, the number of audios he had, and how many videos he would watch, DVDs, and he just, I, and I was having lunch when he was in his mid-70s, so here's this guy, so successful, so much full of wisdom, and he never stopped reading. Mm. He, he would read three hours a day. I love the Velveteen Rabbit, mm. where they talk about life. It's about becoming. Mm. And that reminds me that it's about be becoming. And it is, it is the, like an opening up of, um, of how you learn to finally bloom. And then you get to share that. Well, let me ask you, what is one? I read your book, Take Two. It was awesome. Can't wait to read the next book. Thank you. You have so many great nuggets in there. If you could share with me just one. Oh, it's the trick John Wooden question? Yes. That's the one. <laughs> if you could share with me, hey, James, you know, I've got 50 great ideas, and a lot of them are your life story and how you bounce back from adversity. But if you could say, hey, James, you know something that's really, maybe it's something that worked for you. You know, here's something that would work for me, so maybe it'll help you. What would you tell me? Simple. Test drive your dreams. Mm. That, to me, has been, it's the thing I keep coming back to mm. because we, we think dreams are precious, mm. and they are precious, but until you realize that you're driving the dream, you're the one controlling the dream and where it goes and where you want it to go and where it can take you, mm. and the, the visual of being out on a track and being able to test drive it and say, you know, I'm a high-performance vehicle, so mm. I'm going to be, and if the dream doesn't fit or if it no longer fits, there are a lot of people that said, I, gosh, I, I really wanted that red sports car, and then they didn't get it and they realized the car they have now they love better or mm. thank heavens I didn't get that boyfriend that I obsessed <laughs> over for so many years because now what I have is so much better. Mm. So dreams change. Mm. I think they always come one size too large so that we can grow into them but we get to change them and we get to throw them out. Um, we, we get this false thinking that somebody tells us you, oh you're the you're the mathematician or you're the extroverted one or you're the one that does so and so and we go through life thinking that's who we are mm. So for me, I, when I get stuck in those moments, I go, well, maybe I should test drive this and see if it fits still. Mm. They don't always fit for life, do they? Yeah, and then I guess unless you test drive them, you don't really know. You don't really know. Yeah. yeah. I test drove a car one time and realized that it was going to screw up my back because it was too small for me. Imagine well, most cars would be too small for you. <laughs> Imagine if I didn't test drive. I know, I need one that has like a, a hole in the roof so my head can stick yeah, out longer. Yeah, you need it. <laughs> all cars must have bikini tops so you can like... <laughs> Have your head popping out saying, here I am, here I am. That's the visual actually that I have for you is kind of like, I think about you and you're always like in here I am mode, which is pretty awesome. My head's above the uh, windshield, but I'm good. You, you show up, you show up for your life. You know, I want to uh, have you tell me also, I love what your mom's quote uh, was that oh. you always use and I well, love it. I think it's, it's amazing. It's so simple. My mother, Southern Steel Magnolia, had an answer for everything, including when I wasn't developing breasts as a little girl. And, but, you know, women get, get uh, womanhood mm -hmm. uh, at different times. Like, usually it's around sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Now it's like third grade. I don't know what's, what we're doing in the milk for kids these <laughs> days, but they're developing fast. When I really didn't need a training bra, but I had one, I was very concerned and would say to my mother, you know what? And she would go, oh, honey, don't, don't worry. You're going to get yours. Don't worry. They're coming. They're coming. And I'd be like, okay, when? <laughs> they need to arrive. And my mother said, oh, darling, don't worry, they're coming. And besides, what God's forgotten, we'll stuff with cotton. And that was my mother. That's quintessential my mother. It's her basic answer for everything. Mom always told me, darling, all you can do is just show up, do your best, mm. let go of the rest. Mm. And if you're Love doing that. your best, you really can 
stop beating yourself up because you did the best you could at that moment. But that's got to be the goal. Showing up is really essential, isn't it? I love that. Yeah. If you, if you don't show up, you can't go up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I feel like you're my brother. <laughs> From another mother. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this.